Hello, and welcome to this training and coaching with WKO. This is lesson six, monitor your training with WKO. All right, let's just jump into it. We've gone through the original lessons and have kind of worked through the process of uh, training and coaching with WKO. Let's talk about the final step. You've gotten your kind of training design, you're implementing training, and now we want to monitor it. When we begin to think about monitoring training, here's probably where you should develop your process the most. Uh, not really proper English, but the reality is, right, here's where you really get custom. You know, you're, you're, you're doing as a coach or self-coached athlete, you've created all your prescription and everything else. And when you begin to think about how you monitor, it's super important you start by asking yourself, what do I want to know? I think a lot of times I see people setting up analytics and custom analytics and charts and this and that, but they don't take the time and say, what do I want to know? I'm going to demo uh, sort of my personal setup here because uh, I built it into some of the normal views, but the reality is I'm not going to actually show you mine. It's very custom. It's been developed over years. I have really spent the time asking myself, what do I need to know? Um, and to me, the more I do that, the more I drill down into the key pieces of information instead of just looking at everything, I start where I need to start. Second, you want to set the time frame and depth of tracking. So for me, I look at, you know, and this is kind of my three tiers of this workflow. I look at daily notes and any major issue. I try not to over stress about the daily activities. Um, I'll read notes. If the athlete sends me a note, I require all my athletes to write notes. If they send me a note that makes me like, wow, something's wrong or something really good happened, right? I'll drill deeper. But otherwise than that, I avoid over analysis of the individual days. Don't get me wrong. I'll quickly look at intervals and see how they did and how they, they didn't. But the reality is I'm going to do that more in depth when I look at the whole week or cycle because you don't got to be careful not to over manage a tree and always stay focused on the forest. Now, I do do a full weekly review. I set time points with an athlete. I don't always do this with them, but with the athlete data, I should say, where I'm doing a full weekly review. And then I also do a full cycle review. I think it's important that you look at things over time. So therefore the weekly and cycle or every four weeks or monthly uh, is a way you could say it, uh, is the time frame in depth. And finally, I use a drill down methodology. I've designed my own workflow that has key performance indicators, and then I'll drill down if I need to. And when it comes to drill down, what do I mean by that, right? I have two terms here that I use, a direct drill down, like, wow, I want to know more about the power output this person was doing all week or all cycle, or I want to know more about a specific output or a specific result. I already have a group of direct analytics that I will look deeper based on the kind of category I'm looking at. But also there's situationals, um, you know, what I call OTS or on the spot analytics based on a situation. If an athlete is having a problem, you know, data analytics can really help you solve problems because you can look and hopefully uncover causes. So if an athlete comes to me or an athlete, you know, struggled in a cycle, fatigue was high, something was going wrong, power was dropping. A lot of times as I doing those analytics, we can create situational analytics. Um, I don't create situational analytics though, unless I have to, unless I'm solving a problem. One of the other issues I see a lot is people create a lot of analytics, but if they're not actionable, if they're not solving a problem, you know, you might be adding more time to your workload than you want. All right, so let's just jump into the process by breaking it into two categories. I break it into training content and load and training response. So let's first focus on training content and load. We're gonna talk about compliance, performance management, time and zones, and workout intensity. Um, to me, that member, my, my, I take a drill down process. So this is my top tier review. All of the things I am gonna show you, again, I do have a more custom version of all this. So just being honest with the group, but a lot of my thoughts are in the dashboards or in the views. So this can be found, and I'm gonna use only charts that can be found in both the advanced, WKO advanced, or basic views for cycling. I start with simple compliance by week. We actually need to, need to name rename this chart to be compliance by week. 
Um, I do want to understand over the last time frame, is the athlete generally following my prescription? Because all of my analytics off of that might be, uh, you know, wow, well, they weren't doing what I said they were going to do. Um, so I just look at compliance. Basically, what this compliance chart is doing by the same color metrics and training peaks is if it's above the line, they did more than was prescribed. And if it's below the line, they did less than is prescribed. Green to orange to yellow to red is an extreme. So the reality is you can see here this athlete, both in duration and TSS, tends to overachieve. Some of that could be what your plan is in, in training peaks, but this athlete tends to have a pattern of going a little higher. So I start with right with compliance. So I know the athlete this week, if I'm doing a weekly review or maybe the last cycle of four weeks, they've gone like this last four weeks, they haven't been as bad as they kind of were in here, but I can see this last week, they've kind of begun to go over. So it gives me insight. Was this athlete following the plan? Once I understand that, then I want to pull back and look at it in the bigger picture. And, you know, when we talk about your performance manager chart, really you're talking about looking at the progression of training load and then the resulting acute uh, fatigue and training stress balance. So, you know, uh, ATL, if you want to use the proper term. Um, and the reality is this is probably one of the best charts in there for tracking overall training load. So you can see in this athlete, I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the last 1,095 days, which is three years. We can see there's a pattern. This was a little higher year, but the last year, and you know, we see that going here. Um, we can, I can quickly gauge the three-year pattern. Now I'm going to drill down eventually. I'm just going to kind of click to 365 to 90 to maybe even 30 if I need to. But I also, I always like to start looking at this chart when I'm doing my reviews over time. Because I'm looking at this little window here, right? But that's what I'm, um, I'm generally, I want to see it in the big picture. This chart is great, this advanced chart, because if you notice, there's green points when, and I, this is some duplicate data in this, um, but it turns green. I have a feeling you have a hard time seeing it on your screen. I have a hard time, but you'll see it in the reports. It turns green at points of peak, which kind of show when you might have some peak performances. And you can see that here where it says peak fitness. And when it's red, that means your fitness is very low. Um, you can see the red obviously following rest off season for this athlete. You see that kind of being in that time frame. The TSB, we can see points are red when there's some extreme overreaching, green when they're training in the right zone, and the yellow that's following it is their actual TSB. So we see a lot of green and red. But we note this athlete of late, and this is typical when you get in the racing season, they're not having enough uh, the ATL was dropping, TSB is just the inverse of that, right? We're not seeing enough green and red here. We would need to pick that up and really rebuild. Such a struggle for an athlete that races a lot in the summer. So I'm looking at this and I, what I'm looking for is progression. The progression I'm looking for in the spring, you know, what you're seeing here might not be the same progression I'm looking for in the summer, but that depends, go back to my point, what do I want to know? So this athlete is training load stagnant if not declined. Um, you know, we see them building into and preparing. Obviously, you might might or not, these two peaks are right around the two big summer events. We take a little rest um, and then kind of back at the training. Probably needed to sink <laughs> here to make this work. Um, so that's progression of training load. Next thing that I look at, I have some custom charts in the way I do this, so I'm just picking a general one. But I would highly tell you to track time and zones. It's so important. And to me, if you talk about one of the key indicators of, of predicted performance or predicted excellence or predicted performance improvement, the ability to progress time and zones. And in hindsight, I should have done this as a chart, even though I have one that custom does this. I would command or control click last week, last 30 days, last 90 days, and that'll show you this report, it'll expand this report out and give you insight into the longer and short term trends of this. To me, the key is you need to progress the pure time. This is percentage of overall training in the training areas in the training levels and the training zones that you want the athlete to improve in. 
I consistently see coaching that's saying, yes, we're trying to improve, improve threshold, but you look at their last eight weeks, they're actually spending less time in the general threshold area. I think it's super important that you, know, you understand that to uh, continue to build performance out of the athlete, you have to progress the load and you have to specifically, you know, you have to progress the specific load if you want them to continue to improve. So time and zone tracking is something super important. In some upcoming in-depth webinars, I'm going to show people how to use time and zone more effectively in their coaching. So just understand that that's part of the process and I'm just showing you to be part of the process. I actually use this chart, it's kind of funny. The workout intensity, right, is an interesting chart. All this chart is doing is showing daily TSS in green and each triangle is the IF for the day when it's red, that IF is high, I think it's over 0.9. When it's orange, it's medium, and when it's blue, it's low. So you can see this athlete here does not, and these are all not the same athlete, by the way. This um, athlete does not have many reds. They're not really killing high intensity a lot over the last year. You could probably count them, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? Maybe more intensity um, is needed. But you can see here, I grabbed this athlete because you could actually see this two trends are happening here. You can see they haven't gone hard. They were kind of going hard through the early summer, but lately they haven't gone hard at all, right? What I run in my chart version of this, I have a little trend line here in red. And a trend line, people say, well, how do I customize that? I get that question all the time now as we have so many new users. To edit a chart, right, there's a little down arrow. It's actually right here in the gray box. I have this chart docked, but if the chart was in, you know, a dashboard, it's in the same place. It's just to the right of the name. If you click it, you'll get this little UI right here. Select configure the chart and it brings up this UI. So all you need to do to add a data series is click on the plus button. It'll give you a, yours will say new data series. Um, I named mine trend. And then you need to learn the basics of expression. So I made a trend line by SLR, which is simple linear regression of IF. And all that is showing me is the, um, the average distance between points. But you could see, I guess I'm gonna to have to animate backwards here, right? That this actually is slightly increasing. So even though the athlete isn't going the super high intensity, they just did that block. And for this trend, it probably pulls it up. They are kind of more middling. Um, that's interesting because the athlete here you might find was training more sweet spot and then easy endurance days and here they're kind of emerging. I can just tell you, I guess I've seen this pattern. They're just group riding and riding around with friends more and not training as organized. And you can see the average, the simple linear regression of their actual daily IF is going up. Now IF is just an average, so be careful of it as a whole because if you did a really hard hour of high intensity work and then rode your bike easy for two and a half hours, your IF might look low. But if you look at this from a 20,000 foot view, it's pretty interesting. Okay. Next, let's look at training response. I start with the insights. Um, I'm looking for any new peaks over the time frame. So you see this athlete's had some peaks in the one to probably three hour range. They've done a longer ride with a little more pep to it. But I'm also looking at the physiological and peak power trends because it just basically tells me, um, like, look at this athlete. Um, I think this is a lot of my data. This is exactly why you should never go into the software business. <laughs> um, everything's trending down. So that's immediate insight, right? Into, ooh, wow, that needs to be paid attention to. Now, when you look at the power, it's not quite as impactful on the power numbers yet over the last 90 days, but peak is trending down. Five minutes is trending down. The best you can get out of the rest is kind of flat. Nothing's really changing. This athlete's just kind of in a stagnant mode. Um, it's me. I think a lot of this data is me. Some of it's mixed, but it's starting to be more and more me. It's a, uh, and that's exactly what's occurring. I'm just kind of riding. At, you know, I was doing some training for camps and stuff like that. And now I'm just kind of riding around the best I can find time. So it's pretty indicative. So I start with insights. It gives me immediate insight. That's why we named it that into where the athlete is. I then, for me, and don't get me wrong, I'm looking at different, but one of my ones that I'm always gonna look at is the power duration curve contribution, and I compare it. So if you command or control click, 
and then select multiple ranges you can compare. So here I'm showing the year versus the last 90 days, and wherever you hold the course, or you can hover over that once selected, you can see the data or you can see the, um, the, the actual numbers if they're in the chart, like here you have FTP. The funny thing is that, what is that, about 32 minutes? Um, the last 90 days, 243 watts against the last year, 258 watts. So you really see a decline going on here. <laughs> um, you're welcome. Uh, you know, you just have that, you know, it gives you the excellent ability. And I compare, then I'll look at 45 days and 30 days. I always want to look, because if you think about what's happening, what you're seeing here, you're seeing change, right? And you're seeing response to your, tr or lack of in this example to your training using the compare mode here is very powerful the reason i don't do this just for the power duration curve why i want the compare i want to see if i'm making power differently you see a pretty big change here in both the aerobic you know side of things and the anaerobic i can see the percentages here um, I can see the actual numbers here, and it's more aerobic. There's a decline in my aerobic capability is bigger, and that's simply a reality of no, I don't have time to get on my bike, right? And I'm not really training. So I can not only can I understand there's decline, I can understand which system is declining better. I look at power duration metrics over time, obviously telling the same story. Remember what I said, stagnant? You're seeing trending, and it's actually trending slightly down. Uh, if you look over time, I'm looking at the full year. If I looked at the last 90 days, it wouldn't look good. Anything except there's a little bit of FRC rebuild going on. Um, I can use the trend chart. So these charts are side by side in the power duration um, dashboard. And that's the actual numbers. And that's the trend. So I can see the trends over the same time frame. So you, I use those together. I probably should have taken a screenshot of them together. But I think you get the point. And finally, I use smart segments. I found smart segments to be very powerful for analytics. So this is me, and this is a common 20-minute SST, 20-minute threshold uh, road that I use. I don't have a lot of options like many of you when you start talking 20 minutes. Um, and I can rank my 20 minutes. Um, I went out this weekend the first time in a long time, and I did some intervals, right? I did three times 20. Um, two of which were on my course, right, on my segment here. And the power wasn't great, but I felt like I was going a little faster and maybe, you know, we have bad power meters or we miscalibrate or we wishfully think, right? So then I can go and look at it and say, well, where is that rank in my smart segments? Well, it didn't even make the main screen. So, yep, <laughs> power is down and that's what it's showing me. The reality is though, by being able to flip back and forth by power and speed, it really does give me excellent insight into, you know, going beyond just looking at the number or having a concern about the number accuracy and this and that. So pretty, pretty much just is what it is. Um, you know, that is an excellent way of just going a little deeper and looking at intervals. Well, thanks for joining me. The next session will be the final one in the series, and it's three common mistakes in training with data. Thank you.